Today I'd like to talk to you about uh, what it means to manage victory and salvation well. That's the title of the sermon, Managing Victory and Salvation Well. We're going to look at uh, a central figure in the Bible named Abram and see how he did both and the characters around him did both. Turn with me over to the book of Genesis. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 24. Please stand for the reading of the scriptures. Genesis 14, 17 through 24. Then after his return from the defeat of Chedor Lomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And he was a priest of the Most High, of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, God of, of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 20. And blessed be God Most High, who has handed your over your enemies to you. And he gave him a tenth of everything. Verse 21. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, so that you do not say, I have made Abram rich. 24. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their share. Lord, bless the reading of your word and help us to live, look, and love more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. In Jesus' name, amen. Three things I'd like to talk to you about in this passage. One, conquering an opponent. Two, a conference with allies, and then three, contributions and claims. You're probably uh, looking and listening, saying, he chose the most unusual passage to preach on. There are so many easier passages in the Bible that talk about how Jesus loves us. Why in the world is he amplifying this one here? Well, it's probably a precursor to everything that we do in terms of life every day trying to figure out how do we respond well to what God has done. Let me give you some history, background. Abram is the central character of the Old Testament. I say that knowing that there are a lot of very important human beings in the Old Testament. You got Moses, you got Elijah, you got David, you got Noah, you got Adam, you got Eve. I mean, uh, big names. And so it's hard to compare and say one's more important than the other, except that God did with Abraham something that is carrying over to us with respect to what it means to have a promise of salvation. He told Abram, I want you to leave your family. He was from a place called Ur of the Chaldees, which today would be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, maybe around close to Turkey, somewhere in the area of Iraq. And, uh, he was moving from there. This is after the Tower of Babel. He moved from there to a place called Haran, and God said, I want you to go and leave your family, and I want you to go to the place that I will show you. God did not name where that place was. He just said, go. We have no record that Abram had ever talked to God before or heard from him. But yet he knew that, he was, his, that the Lord's voice was distinct from any other voice he had heard. And somehow that this one was the supreme maker of the universe and he needed to be followed. And so Abram, by faith, left wherever he was, which by this time he had moved from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran, and Haran would be known somewhere in Lebanon, came down and kept going south. By faith, not knowing where he was going, and, and when, he, when he got where he was supposed to be, God said, this is it. And he began to offer sacrifices and began to serve the Lord with faithfulness. He was the first man who had to obey God by faith and go places that he didn't know anything about and didn't know how he was going to get there and had to believe him, meaning the Lord, for protection once he got there. Because generally speaking, every place you went, somebody said it was theirs. Somebody already lived there. And so to go some, to some place and, 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 and now have God tell you this is really my property is pretty audacious. But he was not arrogant. 
every place he went in the promised land, which was the place to which he was to go. We now call it Israel. Every place he went, he made friends. And when we think about Abraham, we need to think about him being much larger than just a man and then a woman, a wife. His wife's name was Sarai. Now, when we think about Abraham, it's important to know his name was not Abraham yet. His name would be changed in Genesis 17 to Abraham, but now he's Abram. Sarah's name would be changed later as well to, uh, from Sarai to Sarah, but now they are Abram and Sarai. And I'm not quite sure of the conversation that happened between Abram and Sarai. When Abram heard from God, but Sarai didn't. Uh, baby, it's time to move. Well, 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 wait, 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 wait. Why? We like it here. Well, God spoke to me. Who? Remember now, they, there wasn't much delineation. Uh, between an idolater's idea about who's, who, who God was and who God was. And for all we know, Abraham, Abram was practicing idolatry just like everybody else. There was no real clear, clear definition of, of, of God revealing himself to people except here. So this was distinct. So Sarah might have said something like, which God? Eh, the God of the universe. Uh, you, there's one of those? You mean he, he controls all the other gods? Well, I don't know about other gods, but I know this one is real. And he told me to go. Okay. Where? I don't know. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You mean this God of the universe who is God over all things told you to go someplace but didn't tell you where? You got it. Well, well why don't we do this? You go. Now, everything I'm telling you is not in the Bible. I'm making all this up. But all the women know a conversation like that happened. You know it happened. And I'm just sitting there thinking, wow, I'm not only impressed with Abram, who didn't know where he was going and only found out where he was supposed to be when he got there. I'm impressed with Sarah, who followed a man. Yeah. See, last week I got on the men, and all y'all women were, yeah. Yeah, get him, get him. Mm. She followed a man who didn't sound quite right. I mean, it didn't resonate in her soul. It made very little sense. But she said, okay, I don't just trust you. I trust who you heard. And I believe if he spoke to you, that he's going to provide for me. See, ladies... You don't trust in your husband. You know you can't do that. <laughs> Just like nobody should trust in any man with all their heart. Now, surely, yes, we trust people at a certain level. But reality is the closer you get to somebody, the more they're going to break your trust. They're human. And whether it's you trusting your husband or your husband trusting you, somebody's going to blow up on somebody. Somebody's going to mess up. And then you're going to have to do the thing called forgiveness. And then reestablish trust because you can't live with people you don't trust. You've got to figure out how in the world am I going to live with this human being that I don't trust but I love deeply. And I, I, I believe in him and I don't want or I believe in her. You have to figure out how to find the grace of God in conflict. You have to or else you will be with nobody. Help, help. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't clap. I don't have time. And nobody. Listen, you will be with nobody and nobody will be with you because you are the person that you're talking about. I don't know, but I am so impressed with Sarai. I don't know all the conversation, but this woman just said yes. And they went. Now, in their going, Abram had some cultural things he had to navigate. God said, leave your family and go to the place I will show you. This is Genesis 11 and 12. And so he, he, he has a problem. They were in a place called Haran. They had moved from Ur the Chaldees, which was about three, 400 miles east to Haran, which is in the Lebanon area, and now they were supposed to go south. In Haran, Abram had a brother, and his brother's name was Haran, just coincidentally the same name as the city. His brother died. When they go through familial names and they list all the siblings, they generally do it in birth order, and Abram is always listed first, so this means he's probably the eldest. That's important. 
because if one of the younger siblings has a, has a situation and he gets an illness and he dies, the children that are his now become the eldest brother's charge. They fall under his care. Haran had a son named Lot. And Lot now became Abram's responsibility. So he could leave his family for the most part, but he couldn't leave him because now this was like his boy. He and Sarai had no children. Lot became their charge, indeed, like a son to them. Lot was older. He wasn't a baby. He wasn't a child. He was old enough to be able to have flocks and herds and everything else and care for whatever his father gave him as an inheritance. So all of them travel into the promised land. And Lot doesn't realize how lucky he is, how fortunate, how blessed he is of God. He is traveling not just with his uncle, but he's traveling with the principal hinge of history. This is the man God spoke of and said, In you, every nation will be blessed. From you will come the promise of salvation for, for the entire world. In you, I will establish my covenant so that all people groups can come to the knowledge of the truth. This was Abraham's blessing. God called this one man for this one purpose. That's why he is so important in the Old Testament and probably has no equal. Nobody's more important than Abraham in terms of our salvation experience and the blessing to the entire world. David was fabulous when it came to understanding Israel's dominance in the nation and what it meant to have a heart after God. But the covenant of salvation, not just the covenant of leadership, fell upon Abraham. And Lot got to go with him. What a deal. I mean, I lost my daddy. I, I'm sorry about that, but like, wow. I get to travel with the man who heard from the God. I'm really blessed. You would think that's what Lot would say. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. As they were traveling through the promised land, they were, they, they were two groups of people, fairly large. So as I said before, you shouldn't just think of Abraham, excuse me, Abram and Sarai as just Abram and Sarai. He was a people. Even though he didn't have children, it says there were 318 men that were trained in his house. So those were shepherds, herdsmen, tailors, cooks, tent makers, all kinds of folks to help care for all that was Abraham, Abram's. And those 318 men probably were married. So now we're talking about 636 people. And then they probably had kids. So we're talking two, three, four thousand folks and all the herds and flocks necessary to provide for all those people. And then you've got to have property whereby all those herds and flocks can actually eat and drink. So when they came into the promised land, it was one of these, every, every nation obviously believed that their property was theirs. When they came into the promised land, they were intimidating. They were like a roving city. And then you've got lots of people. Inherited from his father and all the flocks and herds he's got. And they were traveling as one people. And you can then understand a little bit if you know anything about agrarian culture. you got to have enough property for your sheep and, and cattle and camels and donkeys to eat. you got to be enough pastures. Well, a dispute arose. This is in the Bible. A dispute arose between Lot, Lot's herdsmen, and Abram's herdsmen. Such a dispute the dispute was so sharp that Abram had to get in the middle of it. And it was all about who gets the best grass. Now, if you're Lot, and you would, you would understand that you are with the principal hinge of history, you would say, listen, I'm happy to get the nubs after your sheep eat. I'm good with that. All I want to do is be with you. It's, it's my life privilege. I, I've never had this opportunity before. You're amazing. I don't want to go anyplace else. I'll never complain. <laughs> God has blessed you wonderfully. I don't know where you find yourself, but generally speaking, Thanksgiving is not necessarily the thing that comes out of people's mouths when they think about their station in life. <laughs> It might come later when they, when they ponder it and realize it's probably not a good attitude to not be grateful. But you've got to overcome so much I wish I had 
How come I don't have? They have, but I don't. A competitive spirit that can be good in sales, but bad in worship. And there's nothing wrong with being very ambitious and forward-moving in your desire to, to be successful in business. That is good. But to step on somebody to make it happen violates your integrity and compromises your worship in order to give you success. And so it's important for you to maintain your Christian witness in all that you do, even when it seems like you're lacking, because your God is big enough to give you whatever you need. And you do not have to bring somebody else down in order to build yourself up. You do not. <clears throat> Lot said, I need mine first. Ungrateful was he. Abram does what I just said. Shows an attitude of worship in his relationship with his nephew. He could have said, boy, listen to me. Have you lost your mind? I, could, I should have left you home with your, with your grandpa. That's what I should have done. Tara was daddy, Abram's daddy. I should have left you home. with what? You have been nothing but a, I can't believe I brought you. Those words could have come out of his mouth, and every one of them would have been true. But Abram says this, son, pick your spot. Choose where you want to go. I'll go the opposite direction. He said his eyes went down toward the luscious valley in Sodom and Gomorrah, that infamous city that is distinguished by the fact that it's the only one that God judged from heaven. <laughs> he didn't use armies. He didn't use bombs. He didn't use spears. He used fire and brimstone from heaven. The only other city that really, you know, had the help of God in its destruction would have been Jericho. But that was in combination with the people's shouting and their trumpet blasts on the seventh day as they marched around. And the walls came down without any intervention from human beings except their voices. But this didn't even come with that. This just, God said, you're done. And started raining. That city is where, where Lot decided to go. It was the worst city run by the worst people in the promised land. It had a reputation. We'll see later. Now, Sodom was paying tribute to the king named Chedorlaomer, And there were, other, there were three other kings with them. And Sodom and Gomorrah were pay, paying tribute. That's a fee that you pay to another nation in order for them to protect you. And if you renege on that fee, they'll come beat you up. It says they paid it for 12 years, but in the 13th year they didn't. In the 14th year, Chedor Lamar decided, we're going to take you over. And they came down to Sodom and Gomorrah. They beat them up, took all their stuff, all their people, and locked. Abram hears of it. Abram goes, oh, shoot. Do you all have any lots in your life? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you didn't plan on, on, on bringing them. They weren't supposed to be a part of your journey, but they're family. <laughs> and you're just, you're just thinking, oh, oh, yeah, Holly, welcome. And, 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 and you you're look at the, this is, this, is, this is not a part of my journey. This is a side problem. It's not even a part of the issues that are facing my life right now that are central to my progress. This is, a, this is the thing I got to give myself to because it, it's really distracting. Lots do, but all of us have them. And some of you are him. <laughs> stop being him. You can stop being him, by the way. You can stop. You can repent right now. If somebody has rescued you. <laughs> Abram's saying, oh, I got to strap it on. I got, I, I got, I got to go. I got to ride. We got to go get my nephew. He's my charge. I can't let him just go be a captive. I can't, I can't, I can't. Now, if you remember in the fourth or fifth grade when you went through your sociology classes about the area of Mesopotamia, this is it. And generally, the armies in Mesopotamia around 2500 BC had mm, somewhere in between 5,000 and 20,000 members in it. Most of them were around six, the largest armies. It says that Chedor Lamar had three other kings with him. So this army was somewhere in the neighborhood, we think, of 
10 to 15,000 people that had attacked, it was four, four kingdoms, that had attacked five kingdoms in one. Abram was not necessarily a kingdom. He just had 318 men trained in his house. Now, he also developed some allies when he went into the promised land. Three guys named Aner, Mamre, and Eshkel. These three, we, had, we believe, had some degree of uh, military might, but, but probably not on the order of what these kingdoms were. Because Abraham was not a king. He was just a family guy. He was a man who ran a family business. And, and neither were Aner, Mamre, and Eshkel. But, they, but, but Abram had a responsibility. And so he goes after these four kings and beats them. And brings back his nephew Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah and all the people and all the stuff. This is where we pick it up. When Abram comes back, it's one of these, that shouldn't have happened, moments. We should not have won, except God gave us victory. I should not have come back with my men, except God gave us victory. Lot should be still captive, but God gave us victory. We were outnumbered. Some 20 to 1, but God gave us victory. And Abram realizes that should not be save God. He's the only one that allowed this to happen. And so he comes back. And he's sitting there looking at all the stuff, all the people that he's acquired from Sodom and Gomorrah and the other kingdoms that were taken captive. And he's, he's, he's in a moment of, of wow. And a guy comes out to meet him. His name is Melchizedek. First time we see him. He is king and priest of a city called Salem. And he comes out to meet him. We don't know where Salem was. We think it's the, the, the beginnings of foundation of the city of Jerusalem. But he comes out to meet him. And he says, Abram, God of most high has blessed you. And he he has given you victory over your enemies. Abram realizes that because it resonates in his soul that he shouldn't have this victory, but God did it. And this man here has confirmed it. He's a priest and a king, kind of, if you look over in the book of Hebrews, it calls Melchizedek kind of a forerunner to who Jesus was because Jesus was both a king and a priest. And so what we see here is somebody coming out to recognize and to honor somebody for saving somebody who most people would not think deserved to be saved. He got it in himself. Deserves and that serves him right. He deserved to be in, in, in difficulty. He went down to a city and separated himself from me. Good riddance. Everything would say Lot got what he deserved. But Abram... Loved him too much. And this is the way God has treated us, is it not? All of us have gotten ourselves in situations that deserve judgment. Deserved it. And yet God has delivered us time and time again with the ultimate deliverance being salvation from our sins. But we deserved worse. And Abram is an Old Testament shadow for type, if you will, of what Jesus would do for us. He went to the enemy and took us back. Are you listening to me? <clears throat> when Jesus went back to heaven, there was a, a moment where the Father said, sit down. Congratulations. Well done. This is the moment for Abraham with Melchizedek. You're blessed. Well done. God blessed you. He helped you win this victory. And it says he gave him bread and wine. We took communion today. How much more imagery do you need to see that God hasn't changed his plan from the beginning? He just uses different formats and, and methods in order to make the same thing happen over and over and over again. So we get it. It's not complicated. It's very simple. But it is hard for us to understand because our brains are so messed up. We are so naturally thinking we forget to be spiritually inclined. 
He's had one thought from the beginning to get us back into his presence without the hint of sin. That's all he's thought about. And while we're here to give us victory that we don't deserve. <laughs> oh, this council was amazing. But here comes now Sodom, the king of Sodom. And boy, he's, he's kind of in contrast to the king of Salem. The king of Salem came and brought Abraham a blessing by, way, by word and also brought him a blessing with sustenance. King of Sodom said this. <clears throat> uh, listen, let's make a deal. You give me the people, you can take all the stuff. Now, now, now help me. He just got rescued. What bargaining power does the rescued have? <laughs> okay, let, let, let me see if I can drive it home more. You've seen those shows where in, in the Colorado Rockies, there's a guy that's skiing on the mountains. And there's a helicopter about 500 feet up, and he watches the guy. And then the helicopter probably incited the avalanche. And the avalanche is running behind the skier, and the skier's trying to get out of the way, but he can only go about 40 miles an hour, and the avalanche goes 200, and he gets caught. And you see the skier no more. Well, they send out a rescue team. And they, dogs and, and, and infrared, heat-seeking stuff, and, and they find the place, and it's about 20, 20 feet under the snow. And they see a pole, ski pole, sticking out. Oh, we're in the right spot. This is great. And the guy's dug out a little spot where he can at least get a little air, and they finally get him out. They get to him and get him by the hand, and, and the first thing he would say, this is all made up by me, by the way. The first thing he would say <laughs> is, is, by the way, before, uh, uh, I want the, the, the rights to the story to, with, with CNN. <laughs> Let's leave him down there. <laughs> Just a little... What ought to be the first thing that dude says? Sodom never had those words come out of his mouth. How many bargains have you tried to strike with God? I mean, all of us at some point have said, God, if you, if you do this for me, I'm going to do this for you. If you get me out of this situation, if you get me that girl, if you get me this job, if you get me that A on that paper, I want you to know I'm going to ante up and I'm going to press it. I'm going to go to Grace Covenant. <laughs> this Sunday, not next, this Sunday. And, and, and if you do a little bit more, I might even go to a small group. I might, I might. We bargain with God. What bargaining power does the rescue, rescued have? Our responsibility is just to say, thank you. And by the way, when you bargain, doesn't, doesn't the bargaining have to, have to continue with, with both parties needing something? What does God need you got? <laughs> you have no bargaining power even if you weren't considered rescued. Our responsibility is to be grateful. Sodom was not grateful for his saving experience, and neither. We don't hear from Lot in this portion, not a word, but we do know this, that he went back to live in Sodom rather than coming back to be with Abraham. We know something still wasn't right in his brain. Not right. Abram rescued him. He should have said, thank you, Uncle Abe, and I'm going to be with you. Instead, he goes back. The response and salvation for us ought to be gratefulness. And the response and victory for Abraham was beautiful. And I close with this. It says that when Melchizedek came and gave him bread and wine and told him he was blessed of God most high and that the Lord gave him the victory, it says he gave him a tenth of all. This is the first time we have somebody tithing in Scripture. God thought it was so neat that he made it a law some 1,800 years later with Moses. He codified it. He said, I want all y'all to do what Abraham did. He didn't make it up. He just saw what Abram did and said, that's good. Now, 
Tithing is a really good thing to do, even if you do it by way of command. I don't do it because of command. I do it because I love them, and I'm grateful. For those of you who are concerned about what the New Testament has to say about tithing, well, it doesn't say a whole lot, but it says enough. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus reproves the leaders of Israel, the Pharisees, and says, you all know how to tithe really well on mint, cumin, and dill, but you neglect the weight of your provisions of the law, love, forgiveness, mercy, kindness. You should have done the former without neglecting the latter. He said you should do both. Now, Jesus said, you tithe on mint, dill, and cumin. These were the spices that it was difficult to even weigh. You, if you wanted to tithe on wheat, there was a whole bushel. You knew exactly, but it was difficult to weigh. And, and, and what he meant was, you understand about tithing on the tiniest stuff, but you don't understand the big picture of what it means to care for humanity. What is wrong with you? I'm proud of you for tithing, but you better do this other thing too. So Jesus concentrates on it and says, good on tithing. But even if there wasn't a commendation for tithing and there wasn't a command to tithe, what more does God have to do to get in your pocket? How many victories has he given you? How wonderful has he been to you? Breathing's not a bad benefit, y'all. I mean, I'm just going to start from the least common denominator. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Uh, let's not talk about a paycheck, an employer that hasn't fired you, even when you gave him cause sometimes. Let's not talk about all the opportunities that buses had to run you over and didn't. The diseases that haven't, haven't afflicted you. God has protected you in a ama- What more does he have to do? And all I've concentrated on right now is just the natural stuff. My God in heaven, he saved you. He sent his son to die for you. Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. He died on a cross for you. What more does he have to do to encourage you to be like Abraham? He's given you victory that you could not secure for yourself. Victory over the, over the grave. Victory over death. What more does he have to do? To make you more like Abraham. All Abraham needed was one victory. Just one. Hey, you got my money. You got my 10%. (laughs) This is amazing. And we make God prove himself all the time. How do we manage our victory and how do we manage our salvation? May victory be yours every day because the Lord is with you. And may you respond in a way that, that allows for gratefulness to be expressed tangibly and may you always be grateful for your salvation for how he has decided to love you when to love Brett when Brett was unlovable and sacrifice for Brett when he wasn't worthy of being saved nothing about Brett would commend me as being that valuable enough where the son of God needed to give his life Nothing. I had had decreased my value by my disobedience. There was a residual presence of God in my life, no question. It attracted God to me. But my disobedience made me worth less. But he considered me priceless. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. I can't rationalize it. But what I can do is this. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to be like the king of Sodom. I'm not going to bargain with you about anything. Everything you do for me is a plus. It's a blessing on top of the cake. It's the icing on top. It is over what I deserve. And I just want you to know. I'm grateful. Let's pray. Daddy, I love you. Thank you for your goodness. There's nobody like you. I'm asking that you would inspire us to manage our victory well and to manage our salvation well. Is there anybody this 
afternoon or morning who has yet to give their heart to Christ. Maybe you've made a decision in the past, but your life doesn't look anything like what a believer's ought to be, and you want to make a fresh decision today. If you fit in either one of those categories, raise your hand high. God wants to touch you beautifully. It's a good day to come home, a good day to say thank you. Anybody at all, raise your hand high. I see that hand. Bless you once it's up. You can put it down. Anybody else? All right, you who are online, you may feel the same thing, one of those two categories. Pray with me as I pray with the people in the sanctuary. Say, Father in heaven, forgive me. I am sorry for the way I've lived. I choose to turn away from everything I know to be sin and to follow you with all of my heart. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for giving me the privilege of calling Jesus the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we've got a New Believers Toolkit here for you. And here there is a Bible, Bible study, pen and a pad. Please uh, come down front and somebody will pray with you and be able to give you one of these. Or you can go out the back there to the right in the foyer and talk to the information table. They'll give you one. Um, if you're online, there's a QR code there. Scan that. Somebody will get in contact with you. You can also text with this QR code, New Life, to 82155. 